If you have your Bibles, you can pull them out and turn to the book of Numbers today. And we're in a series, um, Living by Faith in a Culture of Fear. God desires you and I to be people of faith. Say faith. faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. We're to be people of faith in the midst of a culture of fear. And today what I want to talk to you about is how to face your future. There are a lot of people in our country right now that are looking ahead to the future and they're not looking ahead and they would, they would not describe their perspective as something that is optimistic or something that is faith-based, but they are gripped by fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of the economy, fear of the election, fear of all of these things that can very easily crumble that people have placed their hope and their faith and their confidence in. But you and I as a Christian have faith in Christ, which is a greater reality than the things in this world. And so how do we be people that face our future? It's the question that I want to put in front of you today and then break it down into two ways. You will find people that are looking ahead to their future through what I would describe as the telescope of fear. And there are people that are looking to the future through the telescope of faith. You can see it in how they make decisions. You can see it in how they talk. You can see it in their countenance. We are, say I am, am. to be a person of faith. Now as you turn to uh, Numbers chapter 13, the Bible illustrates these principles over and over and over again because God in his wisdom and understanding knew that you and I would be where we are today. We would be facing the things that we're facing and and so many of the problems that take place in a society are things that are honestly on repeat throughout the generations. And so the example this morning is of, of, of the children of Israel when they had been delivered from Egypt, right? They've been delivered to Egypt. They march through the wilderness and it had only been a brief time until they came to the border of the promised land. They have this opportunity before them. God had told them and and their forefathers for for many, many years, for centuries, he said, go and take possession of the land. The land was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now hundreds of years later, they would have been taught as they sat around the campfires, the stories of the promised land, that one day we'll take the promised land. This had been passed on to them for generation after generation from their parents and their grandparents that there would be a day when they would be delivered from bondage and they would be taken out of Egypt and they would confidently march into the wonderful promised land. Now Moses is at the edge of this land now and he says, out of the 12 tribes, I'm going to take one person out of each tribe and I'm going to send you over to the other side and I want you to check it out. He didn't say to go to criticize the other side, but he said, I want you to go check it out, come up with a strategy for taking the land. He's not saying I'm asking your opinion whether or not we should. He's saying, I'm sending you to go, come back with the strategy, come back with the plan. Tell me if it's mountainous, tell me if it's many rivers or not much water, kind of give me a description of the terrain. So please turn to Numbers chapter 13, verses 27 through 33. These 12 spies go out into the land, and we'll read this in just a second. They go out into the land, and for 40 days, they walk around 500 miles. I walked the homecoming parade the other day, and I was pretty wiped out after whatever length that was. Nothing compared, but think 40 days, 500 miles. Now, I don't know how many of us could have survived that, but the mission was a success. Not one person was lost. They come back as they surveyed the land after 40 days of being in this exhausting kind of territory as they're walking. They come back, and here's the report, Exodus 13, verses 27 through 33. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful uh, country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit that it produces. So they're showing him fruit. Here's the evidence. But, everybody say but. But But the people living here, there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. 
And we even saw giants, the descendants of Aak. The Amalekites lived in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, and all the otherites, okay, lived in the country. The Canaanites lived among the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along, along the Jordan uh, Valley. But Caleb, picture these 12 guys giving this report. Caleb tries to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let us go at once and take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who explored it with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report among the people, right, about the land of the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone that goes there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there. We saw the descendants. We felt like you can just kind of picture these little twits. Oh, they're so big. And I feel like a grasshopper. And he's like, you know what? I don't give a high hoot what, I, what you feel. I told you to go explore the land. I came back for you to report. And here you are crying. Everybody say it, crying. <laughs> now, now, this committee comes back. And I heard somebody once describe a committee like this. They said, it's a group of individuals that individually can do nothing. And then collectively, they get together and decide to do nothing. There is some truth in that. So this committee comes back and they're like, here's the report. We can't do anything. But there's two individuals in the pack that stand out. So they bring back the fruit. Now this is like bigger than Sam's Club fruit. I don't know what they inject in those grapes. I don't know where that fruit comes from, okay? But there's something big about, this is like way bigger than even like the Sam's Club stuff that you see. Bigger than the fruit they had in Egypt. They're saying, look, the land's fertile. Look how productive. Look how fruitful, uh, you know, the livestock, they, everything's there. But included in this report, they're like, there are these big giants. What are we going to do? So herein we have a picture of two groups of people seeing the same thing at the same time, walking together through this land, they come back, one group is looking through the telescope of fear, and only two are looking through it through the telescope of faith. Now, before we talk about faith, let's talk a bit about the telescope of fear. Many people, and maybe even here today, people look to the future naturally, financially, with your family, with your job, and you look through it through the telescope of fear. You surround yourself with voices that'll affirm everything that you suspect as you look through the telescope of fear. And when you do that, there are many problems that you'll see through this text that I want to explain to you because they're very similar to the problems that we face if you choose to look towards the future with the telescope of fear. Number one is you will unquestionably overestimate the difficulties that lie before you. That's number one. If you choose to look to the future through the telescope of fear, you will overestimate the difficulties that lie before you. You overestimate the circumstances. You overestimate the problems. Ten of these spies come back and they're, they're like, there's no way we're taking the promised land. And they're looking at it through this perspective because they overestimated the difficulties. They said, we went to this land and it's bountiful. It flows with milk and honey. Basically, that's a poetic way of saying there's beautiful pastures for our livestock. There's lots of farmland. There's plants that can draw their nectar. They're saying this place is desirable, but they're saying we can't take it. Now, you need to understand the background of the people that he sent. These are the people... That, that are coming back and giving this report because these are people that witnessed some very powerful things throughout their history. These people saw the 10 plagues that were sent upon Pharaoh, the mean king. They saw the greatest king of Egypt brought to his knees by the power of God. These are the people that are sent. These are the people that saw the, the river of Egypt, the Nile River turn to blood. These are the people that would have saw the plagues of frogs. They would have saw the disease that, you know, created issues for thousands of cows that passed away. 
They saw the angel of death taking the firstborn. They saw Pharaoh, Pharaoh safe. things like, let my people go. These were people that would have seen the Red Sea open and they would have walked across on dry ground. They saw the Egyptian army destroyed. They had seen God open the heavens and feed them with manna from heaven. They saw God make bitter water sweet. These are the same people that are like, this land is bountiful, but there's no way. It's amazing to me how quick we can forget the faithfulness of God. And when you do that, you see right here, they overestimate the difficulties that lie before. Here's the point. They saw all of the things in the past. They acknowledged that God was all powerful in what he had done. But as they look ahead to the future, what God did in the past didn't translate to the perspective in the future. And they overestimated what they faced. Now this happens to to us here and now all of the time where Christians are saved, they're delivered. They've seen God provide. They've seen God do so many wonderful things. And then all of a sudden, something small happens. The littlest problem turns into a great difficulty. And the things many times we imagine will never happen eventually come to pass because we're so focused on what could go wrong. We overestimate the difficulties. You know, the reality is 95% of the things that you spend time worrying about will never happen. But you choose to focus on those problems. And what you do is you borrow from the future and, and just focusing the, the, the f- powerful future that God has for you, you. It's like worry is so incredibly unhealthy. The Bible says God cares for sparrows. How much more is he gonna care for you? I mean, if he cares about a bird, how much more valuable are you to him? But when you look through the telescope of fear, you, you certainly overestimate the difficulties that are facing. Please turn to verse 33 of chapter 13. Secondly, you underestimate what God can do through you. When you look through the telescope of fear, look at what it says in verse 33. We even saw, pause there, what's the opposite of faith? It's not doubt. We live by faith and not by what? The opposite of faith is actually sight. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. They say, look, we're seeing these giants And they're looking simply through their perspective, forgetting the reality of the God who told them to go who has a higher perspective. So here's what they're doing. They're so focused on their human perspective of the situation. See, you're gonna underestimate what God can do when you choose to look through the telescope of fear. So many times we look at problems that are ahead and they seem like giant problems from our perspective because they are. But from God's perspective, they are not giant problems. You have to choose to be a person of faith that doesn't allow sight to determine your final perspective on a situation. If God tells you something, you go with what he says, whether you see it or not. Faith over sight. Our problems do not look like giants from God's perspective. So this is what happened. They had been free from slavery in Egypt, but mentally they're still a slave. These people were free from slavery, but in their minds, their minds are still enslaved. And this is what happens today. People are free from the power of sin. People are free from the bondage of sin. And they're still slave to the fact that many times they look at the challenges that they're facing through the telescope of fear. And it's nothing more than looking at it through the devil's perspective. And you talk yourself out of being a person of faith, which is why Paul says in Romans chapter eight, God doesn't give Christians a spirit of fear. He gives us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. These people are still in bondage to fear. They have been freed from slavery, but mentally they're still in chains. Look at what else it says. Turn to verse 32. I want you to see how fear brought rebellion 
It says in verse 32, so they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. Here's what they said. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. God's the one that told them to go. And they're saying, you know what? There's, it's inconceivable that anybody's gonna cross over into there. The land is gonna devour. So they wanna rebel against God's word. They want to rebel against God's plan. Can you imagine what that did to the heart of God? How it cut his heart when he saw such unbelief in the people that he said, go possess the land. He said, I've given you my word. I've given you my directive. And now you're gripped with unbelief. You think there's no way. Basically, you're saying, yeah, we understand that God told us to go, but we don't believe he's going with us. And we believe we're going on our own, as if God's not great enough to conquer the enemies in the promised land. They knew his plan, but they found an excuse called fear to disobey. Now, the Bible says that we're to be triumphant in Christ. The Bible says we're more than conquerors, what? Through Christ, right? And over and over and over, we see, even in Christianity, where people look to the future through the telescope of fear, and with their mouth, they spread the bad report about our future. By God's grace, may that not be us. I heard the acronym one time of fear is this, false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. Many times, it's nothing more than just a scarecrow on the surface, but there's nothing to it. Everyone is going to be devoured. The telescope of fear. It continues. Look at what it says in verse 1. Turn to verse 1 of chapter 14. You see how fear brought regret. This is insane when you really think about it. Then the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. They're so gripped by this bad report that they're saying, we want to go back to Egypt. We longed for the good old days when we were slaves and got beat. We longed for the good old days when we worked in the mud pits in Egypt. We longed for the days when someone told us to go to bed and someone told us to wake up. We are free now, but we want to go back to slavery. That's what fear does. It brings regret. It keeps you living in the past when God is focused on your future. There are so many believers, and, and I say this gracefully, I love what God did in your life 20 years ago and 30 years ago, but if you're still talking about those stories, you're missing what he's doing today and he desires to do tomorrow. There's something in us that loves living in the past, the Chevy Impala days, the old, the old yeah, you, you get it. There's something in you that's like, man, I just liked when cars weren't all electric. You know, you could put a light bulb in it and you can fix something. And now you need an electrical engineer to, you know, change the light bulb. You long for the good old days. I wish we could go back to like pre-cell phone, pre-internet. The world is just so much messed up. I wish we were back in the little simple good old days where we, people live in the past as Christians. And we see this here in the story. They're like, let's just, just send us back to Egypt. Let's just be enslaved to the past when God has so much more for you in the future. The greatest days, you have to be convinced, God's greatest days, whether you're 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 80 years, God's greatest days are ahead of you. But if you choose to live by fear, you're always going to be the one sitting around talking about what God used to do. You see, fear also brings resistance here. You see all the negative things that are happening in verse two. It says, their voices arose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If we had died in Egypt, if we had died in Egypt, even here in the wilderness, you see them complaining against the leaders. We see how fear brought retreat. Look at what it says in chapter 14, verses th uh, three through four. Why is the Lord taking us into the country only to have us die in battle? Our wives, our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted against themselves. Let's choose another leader and go back to Egypt. They wanted to retreat. 
As a believer, retreating from anything is nothing other than sin. Retreating from anything God has told you to do is nothing more than taking a directive from the enemy. God's desire and his best is always forward and is always upward. Healthy things grow. Healthy things move forward, including your life. But man, you hear the language here and it's like, you know what? If I had a football team, I wouldn't want them on my team. If I had a discipleship group, I wouldn't want these 10 guys. It's like they're doing nothing more than just telling me the devil's perspective on something God had told me to do. Bunch of complainers. Now let's talk about the the telescope of faith. Because we see 10 of them come back that All 12 saw the same thing. 10 come back and they're whining and they're complaining and they're saying, let's spread the report. Let's go back to bondage. Let's get new leaders. They're like, fear is just like destroying them and it'll destroy you. It'll destroy a family. It'll destroy a leader. It'll destroy. But faith is very different. Faith brings God's perspective into the equation. Turn to chapter 13, verse 30. Among the 12, there are two spies that say, you know what, we can do it. There's Joshua and Caleb. They didn't see anything different. They didn't hear anything different. But they return with this perspective of faith. Look at what it says in verse 30. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Here's what he says. Let us go at once and take the land. Certainly we could conquer it. We wonder what the 10 people were doing as he's like, yeah. They're like, shut up, you idiot. You know? <laughs> he's saying, immediately, God told us we could conquer the land. Let's go. Yeah, I saw the giants. Yeah, I saw what you saw. But you know what? I came back with a faith. Faith is a single, single-minded commitment to the word of God. Single-minded Faith says, you know what, God, I have your word, and I have a single commandment or a single-minded commitment to your word, whether it's a spoken word or it's a written word. Fear says, yeah, yeah, that doesn't apply to me. Fear says, maybe that's not for now. Faith is a single-minded commitment to the word. And so they come back and they're like, God spoke it, let's go. What was that? That was God's perspective of what the 10 should have been saying. But only two of them were looking at the same thing through the telescope of faith. Now, as you walk through life, as you walk through seasons of of uncertainty in, in our country, in your home, in your work, whatever you're facing, you must have a single minded commitment to the word of God if you want to keep and stay in a place of faith. The news will say one thing, economists will say another. Your bozo neighbor may tell you something else. But if you want to be a person of faith and stay in a place of faith, you must have a single-minded commitment to the word of God whether you feel like it or not. It's a higher reality than any other thing you're gonna face in this life. It's even a portion of scripture that that says the Bible is exalted even above his name. Anybody have the reference for that? What? Psalm 138, 138. he gets a bonus. (laughs) Psalm 138, his word is exalted. His word is our final authority. And so they have God's perspective. They have the word of the Lord. Last week, we talked about the reality of valleys. They are real. But when we acknowledge that God is with us in the midst and we acknowledge his word, we have a higher perspective than the things that we walk through. It's the same thing here in this story. Secondly, as you look through the telescope of faith, not only do you have God's perspective with what you're facing, you have his protection Turn to chapter 14, verse 9. Caleb told the people that if they would go, that they would have the protection of God. And if you look at the next verse here, chapter 14, uh, verse 9, he plainly tells them God will protect them. He says, don't rebel against the word of the Lord. 
Don't be afraid of the people in the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. That's a leader. He's like, you know what? 10 out of 12 of us are saying the the land's gonna devour us. And he's saying, why are you afraid of them? If God's protection goes with us, when you walk in step with the Spirit, when you live a life that it's in accordance with the word, there is a protection that is with you, spiritually speaking and physically speaking. Caleb knows God called us, we're gonna go with the word of the Lord and in going with the word of the Lord, he's gonna back us up. He's gonna be there. He's going to protect us. He's like, their protection's gone. What are, you, what are we worried about? Now, this is interesting. Here's something they found out. 40 years later, as they came back to the same place when they took Jericho, they were told in Jericho, when you came here the first time, we had heard of you and we were afraid of you. Wow. The big people were afraid of the small people. They were afraid of them. The giants were actually afraid of the people of God and they walked off, walked away, and their protection was gone. Greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world, whether you feel like it in the moment or not. Everything bows to the name of Jesus. Look at what it says in verse 30. Turn to chapter 13, verse 30. I know you're going back and forth. Faith brings God's power when you look through the lens of faith. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land. We can certainly do it. We can certainly conquer it. This isn't a man speaking in and of himself. This is somebody that is fully convinced that if I go with the word of the Lord, the power of the Lord is with me. Many things that grip Christians spiritually and cause them to look through the lens of fear is they're not convinced that God is with them. We talked about this last week as you walk through the valley. You need to know God is with me. And if God is with me, God's power is there to help me. You can see him like almost shouting this like, let's go, we can certainly conquer it. This isn't Caleb like, yeah, I did some extra push-ups this morning. Ate my Wheaties, if that's even a thing now. This isn't a man speaking of himself. He's saying, God is with me. God is for me. There's nothing that's gonna hinder. I love how confident he is. He's like, why would God even, you know, this is a question you gotta really ask. Why would God even give people his power if they weren't attempting to do anything for him? Why would he do it? Why would he give his power to people who are not asking for anything? Why would he give his power to people that are not expecting anything? Why would he give his power to people that aren't gonna take the word and say, this can be true for me? Look at what it also says about faith here. Not only does it bring God's power, turn to chapter 14, verse 24. It brings his prosperity. Prosperity in every area of of life. Here's what he says in verses, uh, well, let me read seven through eight of chapter 14, and then we'll put on the screen numbers 14, 24. Verses seven through eight, he, he says, then he said to all the people, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land, and if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land to give it to us. It is a land that is rich, flowing with milk and honey. Now get to chapter 14, verse 24. And God said this of Caleb, But my servant Caleb has a different attitude. Say those two words. Different attitude. We should be people that have a different attitude. We should be people that have a different spirit. We should be people that have a different perspective. He's like, my servant Caleb has a different attitude than any of the others. He's remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants will possess their full share of the land. Wow, God's like, you know what? This guy is different. This guy is looking at it through a different lens. He's looking at it through a different perspective. He has my perspective. He understands he carries my power. He's not gonna bow to fear, but he's gonna 
move forward with faith. And he says right here, he's like, you know what? I'm going to give it to him. I'm going to give him the full share of what is his in this land. God's like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to bless you for being obedient. God's pleased with him and wants to bless him. Now, the real tragedy here is this. Look at what it says in chapter 14, verse 30. He says to the rest, he says, you will not occupy the land, I swore to you. The only exceptions will be Caleb and Joshua. He's like, you know what? Only two of you are going to proceed forward. Now, this is a really solemn portion of scripture. All of these people were delivered out of Egypt. All of them followed Moses through the Red Sea. All of them saw the miracles in the wilderness. And we get to the kind of the fatal climax of an entire generation of people. Chapter 14, verse 32. It says, but as for you, you will drop dead in the wilderness. And all of your children will be like shepherds wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. In this way, they will pay for your faithlessness until the last of you lies dead in the wilderness. Because your men explored the land for 40 days, you must wander in the wilderness for 40 days, a year for each day, suffering the consequences of your sin. Then you will discover what it looks like to have me as an enemy. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will certainly do these things for every member of your community who has conspired against me. They will be destroyed here in the wilderness. Here they will die as the worship team comes back, and I'll steer this around in a direction in a minute. Look to the person next to you and say, this is the old covenant. I'm glad that we're in the new. (laughs) The Bible says, it's not the fear of the Lord that draws people to repentance. It's the kindness of the Lord that draws people to repentance. But we do have these very serious outcomes in some of these stories in the Bible to show you the severity of sin. You know, God, if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I promise Jesus isn't up in heaven like, hey, you know what? You're going to suffer for the next 40 years and you're going to die. You know, that's like you didn't come to church to get bad news. You came to church to get good news. And the good news of it is, you know what? This group was trying to explore a promised land. And only two of them ended up moving forward in faith. Ten of them suffered the devastating consequences of looking ahead to the future through the telescope of fear. Let me just explain this to you in just this way. If you don't know the Lord today, This earth is the only promised land you're ever going to experience. And to be honest with you, it's not too bad of a place, especially in America. But I don't think many times we understand the gravity of sin outside of what Jesus has done on the cross. The Bible said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. You know, there's a lot of people that are in our community that have money, they have a position, may even have a family, but their life is wilderness. Their life is wilderness. And the reality is, if they have sin in their lives, which the Bible says all of us do, you'll never enjoy not just heaven, but the blessings of God on this earth until you become a person of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It takes faith for you to realize that, you know what? I was born a sinner and there's nothing that I can do to reconcile that in the presence of a holy God. It takes faith to believe Jesus lived a perfect life, died a criminal's death, was raised to new life, even though he appeared to over 500 people at once. And they verified that. Many of the people that saw the resurrected Christ paid for that reality with their lives. You don't go to the grave for a lie. 
you're persecuted for your faith and you die, it's not because of a lie, it's because of something you saw. They saw the resurrected Jesus. It's a historical fact. But it takes faith to choose Jesus, to acknowledge sin, to repent of it, and to receive Christ. And when you do, he changes your life. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, he said, there are people that are in life who have eyes, but they don't see. What does that mean? He's saying there are people that have physical eyes, but until you come into relationship with Christ, it's like you're spiritually blinded. I heard a story about a man that was blind, but he was somebody that had the ability to ski and he traveled all over the world skiing. You say, how in the world does a blind man ski? How could he turn to the left? How could he turn to the right? But he developed a very close relationship with a guide that traveled right behind him. And with a stick or a pole or whatever, he was able to tap him to the right, tap him to the left, tapped him from behind. And this man had the ability to ski, not on his own, but because he had a guide. When you surrender your life to Christ, what happens is God opens your eyes spiritually. The Holy Spirit comes into your heart and he guides you. There's no reason why anyone should live through life and it be described like a wilderness experience when you can surrender your life to Christ, have his presence within you, guide and direct you. And as he does that, he'll enable you to be a person that is living by faith in the midst of a culture of fear. So many people are gripped by fear. They're holding on to everything they have. Just trying to live one more day. And the reality is they're gonna slip from this life into eternity and they may have clung to stuff on this earth. But what is that in light of eternity? Do you know the Lord today is my question. I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes and let's stand together this morning. I'm gonna have some of our leaders that are gonna come across the front this morning. I just wanna ask you, I'll be available to pray in a minute. Is there a distinct moment in time that you've said yes to Jesus, that you've surrendered sin? You said, Jesus, I'm sorry for what I've done. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Would you come into my life? Would you forgive me of sin? Would you wash me clean? Would you make me a new creation in Christ? Are you a Christian today? And if not, I want the opportunity just to pray with you. I'm not gonna embarrass you, but I am gonna ask you just to acknowledge that to heaven by raising your hand and saying, I'm here today and I need Jesus to come into my heart, to change my life, to open my spiritual eyes so that I can see. Is there anybody here today you wanna acknowledge that by raising your hand? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If not, our leaders are gonna make themselves available. We would love the opportunity to pray for you. If you're struggling today with fear in any way, the first way you break through is you need to acknowledge that it's an issue. I think sometimes at church we struggle with acknowledging that we're wrestling with something. But if you want to be a person of faith and walk and stay in a place, but you are gripped specifically with something related to fear, We want to take time and we want to pray for you. If you're sick in body, we'd love the opportunity to pray with you, to anoint you with oil, and to trust that the Lord is going to heal you this morning. So what we're going to do, some of our leaders will be available. We're going to pray. We're going to worship for a bit. And then you can be dismissed whenever you need to this morning. If you are part of the Access Connect group that's going to be meeting, we're going to be downstairs in like three minutes or so to do that just to welcome people that are new to our church. But I want to just pray a blessing upon every person. Father, I pray your blessing upon every person that's here today. Lord, we acknowledge that our culture, our media, so many of the things that speak into people's lives are filled with the perspective of fear. God, we ask that you would enable us to be people of faith, 
Lord, if 10 people are standing saying, there's no way God can do that for you, may we be the people that say, yes, we can. God will go with us. God will provide for us. God will protect us. May we be people that see it in the word, that we stick with the word of the Lord and we enjoy the blessings of being faithful to what you've called us to do. Father, I thank you that you haven't called one person here to be gripped by fear. Lord, may we be people of faith and stay in that place of faith regardless of what comes. And we thank you, Lord, for this. In Jesus' name, amen.